Reenchanting Humanity, a defense of the human spirit against anti-humanism, misanthropy, mysticism, and primitivism, by Murray Bookchin, published by Castle, 1995. Chapter 6. Technophobia and its Tribulations From the 18th century onward, enlightened humanism advanced three basic ideals that it identified with progress. The first and most important of these ideals was a renewed focus on reason, the use of logical thought in dealing with reality. Since the time of the classical cultures of ancient Greece and, to some extent, Rome, reason had been relegated, at best, to a handmaiden of theology. Since that time, social arrangements, not to speak of the natural world, had not been explained in rational terms. Feudal hierarchies and royal power were looked upon as God-given, while social inequities were seen as the unchallengeable dispensation of a deity whose judgment was taken on faith. This outlook was reinforced by the state as well as the church, indeed by tradition as well as by biblical precept, however much radical heretics and popular uprisings disavowed them from time to time. The 18th century Enlightenment stridently and effectively challenged this theistic view of worldly affairs. It persistently counterposed rational understanding to unthinking belief in claims to knowledge and truth, be they in the realm of human relationships or in the natural world. In this respect, the Enlightenment surpassed the Renaissance. Of a century or two earlier, which invoked Greco-Roman canons of art and rhetoric, revering that highly idealized ancient past rather than an innovative present and a rational future. Second, and following from its emphasis on reason, the Enlightenment advanced an increasingly secular view of social reality of a new polity that enhanced individual freedom and legitimate social institutions rationally be they part of responsive constitutional monarchies or republics. Voltaire's famous cry Acrace à l'infame, meant not necessarily a denial of the church doctrine and institutions but rather its infamous control over political, moral, and civil affairs on the strength of dogma, fear, and tradition. Many of the Enlighteners sought to separate church from state, leaving the church with the authority only of a moral force on society. This demand, to be sure, was more than an attempt to obviate ecclesiastical meddling in the civil life of a polity. As rationalists, the Enlighteners were deeply concerned with the adverse role of superstition, mysticism, and mindless beliefs in determining human behavior. Superstition, in particular, they believed, had to be banished from the way human beings viewed each other, through scientific explanations of reality in strictly naturalistic terms. Even more than Enlightenment mechanists whose influence has been deprecated and exaggerated by anti-humanists these days, the subtler critical thinkers of the time, such as Denis Diderot, stressed the focal importance of the natural world as an arena of human inquiry indeed, as a guide to human behavior. To equate the Enlightenment's naturalism with narrow-minded mechanism, without regard for the evolutionary and dialectical theories that were also very much in the air, is to caricature it in support of modern-day mystical and irrational ends. Last, and very significant, the Enlightenment placed a strong premium on the need to control natural forces on behalf of human material well-being. The appalling disparities in wealth in 18th century society, the persistent famines that plagued France, the dire misery of the underclasses in cities and villages, all bucolic images of rural society notwithstanding, the uncertainties of economic life, material scarcity and the necessity for arduous toil, which limited participation in public life, all contributed to the enthusiastic embrace of advances in science and technology with their potential for extending human freedom and personal dignity. This point cannot be emphasized too strongly. Although the Enlighteners did not challenge private ownership of land and the means of production, worked mainly by peasants and craftsmen, they were almost one in their commitment to support scientific and technological advances for social purposes, not ideological hubris for the purpose of dominating nature. As the lavish technical illustrations in Diderot's monumental encyclopedia indicate, the Enlightenment celebrated human ingenuity and its promise to produce a sufficiency in the means of life, indeed, to ease labor, with its implicit message of a more participatory polity, not to subdue natural forces out of a lust for domination. 
if the Enlightenment saw Prometheus as the mythic agent for promoting human welfare, it was not because it no longer respected first nature, indeed, few centuries exhibited a greater devotion to the natural than the 18th century, be it technologically, behaviorally, educationally, or morally. Rather, the Enlightenment directly associated the removal of want and toil from humanity with social improvement and a relatively free polity. The great democratic revolutions of the 18th century, particularly the American and French, were predominantly political events, although they had widespread economic ramifications for the redistribution of property ownership. Their greatest long-range achievements were in the realm of personal liberty upholding the autonomy of the individual in a volatile economic world. The cry of liberty, equality fraternity rang somewhat hollow, however, as the great majority of people who had made these revolutions continued to live in material want, toiling on the land and in newly emerging factories from dawn to dusk. Liberty, without the means of life and the free time to exercise it, seemed merely rhetorical. Equality, in turn, became a mockery of revolutionary ideals as old privileges based on status differences were replaced with new privileges based on differences in wealth. In the 19th century the focus of radicalism shifted overwhelmingly from exclusively political egalitarianism to material egalitarianism, to a form of equality that allowed not only personal political freedom but also dignity and leisure to all laboring classes, be they on the land, in craft shops, or in factories. More specifically the various socialisms of the early 19th century avowed the need for a cooperative society that would bring not only political but economic egalitarianism to humanity, a society based on the satisfaction of human material needs with minimal toil. If humanity were to achieve a truly democratic polity, working people had to acquire the means of life and sufficient free time to participate in it. It was in this context that the underprivileged masses of Europe and the Americas viewed technological advances. Despite Luddite opposition to the use of machinery that subverted traditional crafts, a provisional opposition, let me add, that did not challenge technological advance as such, present-day distortions of Luddism to the contrary, the laboring classes viewed the potentialities for human betterment opened by the industrial world with considerable hope and incorporated them into their programs for social change. Indeed, the resistance to industrialism came mainly from the romantic intellectuals, artists, and mystics who decried the loss of a rural society that they idealized, steeped it in quasi-feudal traditions and a mythopoeic mentality. Not only did these romantics damn the patently harmful effects of capitalist self-interest and exploitative methods of production, they decried reason and the Enlightenment itself whatever the benign intentions of the 19th century romantic movement, their ideas later fed into a seemingly populist movement that culminated in German fascism. Significantly Karl Marx, the most influential socialist theorist of the last century identified the achievement of the material preconditions for a cooperative and free society with the spread of capitalism. He held this view not because he admired capitalist social relations but because he believed that a market economy based on competition would yield vast advances in technological development. Such advances, he contended, would eventually establish the technical basis for achieving the largely political and cultural goals of the Enlightenment as well as the material goals of the emerging socialist movement. There is a tragic irony in the fact that Marx enshrined a class and exploitative social system, capitalism, as an historically necessary stage for achieving an economically emancipated society. Even as capitalism corroded the hereditary ruling stratum of feudalism, it did not challenge domination as such, capitalists were no less domineering than their feudal predecessors. The bourgeois system of domination that they created, however, was harder to define, and hence all the more effective. By creating a myth of individual autonomy, and identifying it with the achievement of the great democratic revolutions, the emerging bourgeoisie could legitimate its de facto rule over society. It made capitalism seem like the result of gritty personal enterprise parsimony, and ingenuity. Its precept of formal equality, be it before the law or in the name of equality of opportunity, concealed the substantive inequality in wealth and influence in society. Indeed, capitalist apologists even denied that capitalism was, properly speaking, a class society at all, 
inasmuch as anyone could become a capitalist if he or she so chose. Marx was intensely aware of this obscurantist subterfuge and properly designated capitalist social relationships as the most mystified in history, a system whereby class rule was shrewdly concealed by the myth of equal opportunity. This mystification of social relationships remains one of the most compelling facts of modern-day class rule. In the past two centuries, it has greatly conditioned ways of thinking generally toward mystification, from which current anti-humanistic ideologies strongly benefit. Marx's claim that capitalism provided the technological preconditions for socialism and hence was progressive, however, raised problems in transforming society that he never theoretically anticipated. How could a society structured around competition lead, even after a social upheaval, to one structured around cooperation? How could a society sedimented by a long history of class rule lead, even after a social upheaval, to one structured around substantive equality? These problems were not adequately resolved by the socialist movements of the 19th and early 20th century, and they linger with us to this day. Yet in many respects, Marx's emphasis on the impetus that capitalism gives to technological development was prescient. The market economy that attained predominance in Europe and America during the past two centuries did innovate an industrial apparatus unprecedented in human history. It fostered a broad naturalistic and scientific understanding of the world, greater by far than the mythopoeic insights of the past, clouded as they were in naive illusions. At least on a strictly pragmatic and instrumental level, capitalism carried much of the world out of an illusory animaism, religiosity, and parochialism, the enchanted world so treasured by the romantics, and into a secular world that encouraged human activity and rational inquiry. At the same time, the capitalist system was a class and exploitative society that was riddled by contradictions and that made for profound social and ultimately ecological instability. From the 1830s to the turn of the century the progressive dimensions often overshadowed its ugly and deeply anti-humanistic aspects, although exploited classes waged desperate struggles against them throughout the Euro-American world. Yet even these conflicts were eventually marginalized by reforms won by trade unions and labor parties of one kind or another. Inevitably European socialist movements flirted with the idea of sufficiently improving the capitalist order so as to render it more equitable and ultimately more cooperative, perhaps even more socialistic. Even as European and American socialist parties were drenched in the radical rhetoric of the previous century they made socialism in England, Germany and France increasingly parliamentary rather than insurrectionary, and they themselves became loyal oppositions rather than revolutionary challenges. The First World War exploded the myth of a slow, progressive social evolution from a capitalistic society to a cooperative society. Beaten down by four unrelenting years of trench warfare and horrifyingly lethal weapons, soldiers from the mass armies of Europe returned home either to topple an entrenched social order in the East or threaten it menacingly in the West. It was during the interwar period, between 1918 and 1939, that European society faced its greatest moment of truth, either it would carry out the historically crucial task of replacing a market society with a cooperative one, or it would spin off into an ominous period of terrible reaction. The tragic failure of various socialist movements in this period to achieve the great goals they had elaborated over the 19th century served to nourish the epical crisis opened in August 1914, a crisis which even the Second World War, bloodier and more destructive than the first, has failed to resolve. In fact, the Second World War formed a sharp boundary between one era of capitalist development and another. The pre-industrial culture of the 1920s and 1930s in America and Europe had not yet been entirely absorbed by the economy, indeed, as dominant as capitalism had become by the end of the 19th century economically it was far from all pervasive socially. Its system of market relationships, what early 20th century social theorists called commodification, had not yet fully penetrated into the largely pre-industrial everyday life of family relationships, personal associations, and community ties. In the years following the Second World War, however, this disparity between culture and economics changed drastically. Starting in the early 1950s the capitalistic market expanded throughout the world, 
to a point where it is now ubiquitous and all-penetrating, even by comparison with the capitalism of merely a generation or two ago. It now permeates nearly every facet of ordinary life, from the bedroom to the schoolroom, from the kitchen to the church. This market society with its defining values of production, consumption, profit, and growth, was only dimly anticipated by Marx in the 1850s, even as his major works unmasked the competitive imperatives of capitalist expansion and its accompanying culture of material acquisition. Consumption for the sake of consumption, or what we now call consumerism, which Marx could not have foreseen, became the counterpart of what he had denoted as production for the sake of production, a driven form of general economic growth that has enveloped the consumer as well as the producer, and has become an end in itself, irrespective of social needs or consequences. Capitalism, abetted by its progressive technological achievements, has thereby acquired a technological persona, a projection of itself as the industrial logic of science and technology as such. Thus, added to its self-mystification as a society of individual autonomy and political freedom, it has acquired still another layer of mystification. The myth that science, technology, and even reason constitute its imperative for unrelenting expansion. This cunning mystification has beguiled nearly all ecomistics and has enhanced the mystery surrounding capitalism's economic and market operations. Not only has the specious sobriquet industrial society become synonymous with capitalism, but today it has virtually replaced it, compounding the mystification that surrounded capitalism from its inception. This mystification may be the most obstreperous of all, having generated a sizable literature, even a tradition, that assigns uncanny powers to technology apart from the social context that determines its use. It becomes difficult for the ordinary person to see that it is not science and technology that threaten to turn the entire world into a huge market and factory, rather, it is the market and factory that threaten to technologize, to objectify or commodify the human spirit and reduce the natural world to mere raw materials for capital expansion. Thus, the dazzling scientific leaps and technological innovations that have occurred since the Second World War are the product of very distinct social relationships and an ever-growing market society. The notion that science and technology are autonomous of society that they themselves are controlling factors in guiding society is perhaps one of the most insidious illusions of our time. That science and techniques conduct lines of research and open visions toward new developments is certainly true, but these developments are rigorously guided by the prevailing market society rather than the other way around, although society abets scientific and technological developments, society also aborts the exploration of new techniques, depending upon the needs that guide corporate research. These needs are overwhelmingly economic, centering on corporate profit and expansionary interests, as witness the stimuli given by large enterprises to lines of scientific research that promise to give them economic hegemony, while willfully ignoring others that, although interesting to scientists or engineers, are not considered sufficiently profitable from a business standpoint. Thus it took years to arouse the interest of business in organic agriculture, solar and wind power, non-polluting fuels, recycling techniques, and many other inviting technologies. Indeed. With the rise of the environmental movement in the 1970s, it was often necessary for scientists and engineers to establish precarious and privately funded institutes in which they could devote themselves to developing environmentally friendly technologies that industry obdurately ignored or even disavowed. Where large corporate enterprises and governmental agencies finally undertook research to explore the possibilities of what I have called eco-technics, they commonly did so only after considerable public pressure. Even today various technologies that would improve safety in transportation, alluring as they may be to engineers eager to sophisticate them, still lie woefully on drawing boards because they are either too costly or too unprofitable from a corporate standpoint. Notoriously the profit-oriented approach guides research in a host of technical areas, including steel-making facilities that, were they put to use would yield products that are lasting, unlike the planned obsolescence worked into appliances, cars, homes, and even tools today. The factory model around which capitalism is structured has given social relationships themselves a technological form, 
just as in the Middle Ages Christianity gave social relationships a religious form. In a sense, every factory is a mega machine, to use Lewis Mumford's word for ways of mobilizing labor. Nor are mega machines peculiar to modern societies based on high technology. They existed thousands of years ago, in the Near East and in the Roman world, when tools were hardly more advanced than in the Neolithic period. The pyramids of ancient Egypt, the temples of Mesopotamia, and the roads of Rome were constructed primarily by the brute labor of serfs and slaves. In the early modern period, capitalism simply mobilized labor more mechanically by making the rural cottage worker an appendage to the spinning wheel and hand loom. In time, the two were brought together in the form of a factory that now encompasses society as a whole not only its economy. Today the unbridled expansion of the market transforms nearly all traditional personal relationships into commodity ties, fostering a belief in the merits of consumption and a highly synthetic image of the good life. Technological innovation has merely made this commodification of everyday life easier to achieve. To be sure, modern technologies may be used, as in the case of television, to promote the sale of goods, to influence taste and to create new wants. Yet by the same token, advertising techniques were always in use whether in medieval fairs, renaissance markets, or large pre-capitalist commercial centers. For centuries, the churches and mosques of pre-capitalist society were immensely effective networks for promoting ecclesiastical, noble, and royal interests, preaching messages of quiet acceptance of duties, awe toward saints, and deference toward one's social betters. Deep-seated social crises were necessary before the captives of clerics could dislodge ecclesiastical control over the minds of the oppressed, a process that is far from completed today with or without televangelists. Conversely even the highly civilized societies of the ancient world regarded technological advances with astonishing indifference at best and active hostility at worst, primarily because servile human labor was cheap and readily available. Not that the steam engine and the paddle wheel were unknown, but they were never put to industrial uses. Ironically well into the Middle Ages, when Christianity, which technophobes regard as one of the most anti-naturalistic of ideologies, reached its height, the powers that be often saw technological advances as demonic, not as an inspiration for pursuing the domination of nature. While capitalism has turned to technology with a fervor unknown to any previous society and dressed it in the mystifying garb of an industrial society, capitalists have notoriously neglected very important technologies and chosen to develop precisely those techniques that benefit its unique imperative for growth and its inflated appetite for profit. I have examined at some length the extent to which technology is a heteronymous or dependent phenomenon because ecomysticism tends to emphasize its autonomy from society and the mystique of a technological imperative, crudely obscuring the profoundly social factors that promote or inhibit technological innovation. Given this simplistic view, modern technology and a technological mentality become the principle, often the exclusive causes of environmental ills, cultural malaise, and the loss of primal innocence. Moreover, contemporary critiques of technology often go hand in hand with primitivism and ecomysticism. The sophistication of techniques, we are often told, has alienated us from nature and our primal roots, rendering us merely parts of a vast mega-machine that threatens not only to destroy the natural world but to diminish our awe before the sacred in the biosphere, our feeling for life, and our contact with the spiritual. From the romantics of the last century to German conservative writers early in the present one, an effluvium of books and periodicals has surfaced, stressing the autonomy of technological development and either explicitly or implicitly calling for a return to technically simpler ways of life. The more primitivistic of the recent technophobic writers call for a return to the pristine lives of Paleolithic cave dwellers, Neolithic horticulturists, or medieval serfs and craftspeople. Whether such views can be accepted at face value is, to put it gently arguable. Owing to the massive inroads personal computers have made into the lives even of technophobes, who are usually unprepared to sacrifice this highly sophisticated device for the quill, one would think that they are as natural as fruit and thrive in Californian orange groves. Indeed, 
few of technophobia's outstanding spokespersons have abandoned the horrors of the civilization they decry to live hermetic lives free from technological subversion, nor do they desist from accepting fees for books and lectures that inveigh against the mega machine and its despiritizing impact on the individual and society. Indeed, one primitivistic, technophobic periodical confessed, we got a computer, and we hate it. Note. E.B. Maple the Fifth Estate enters the 20th century. We get a computer and hate it Fifth Estate Volume 28, Number 2, Summer 1993, Pages 6 to 7. End note. Which causes one to wonder, why acquire one at all when the great revolutions of the past were summoned to action by simple hand presses? If this kind of cant and silliness were all that technophobia produced, it could easily be disregarded. But technophobia raises serious anti humanistic issues that require critical examination. First, technophobia sets up a misleading enemy for committed environmentalists and culture critics, redirecting their attention away from patently social concerns. Well meaning people are urged to focus on a problem that cannot be seriously fought, specifically technology, assuming they agree it is a problem in the first place. Second, Technophobes leave unanswered the strategic question of how a truly democratic society could be possible if its members lacked the means of life and the free time to exercise their freedoms. Claims that a primitive way of life would allow for bankers' hours, to use gerrymanders' expression, are simply fallacious. Note. Gerrymander, in the absence of the sacred, the failure of technology and the survival of the Indian nations, San Francisco, Sierra Club Books, 1991, p. 248. End note. Mander's sources, nourished on the 1960s and 1970s craze for the virtues of Aboriginal ways of life, are now very questionable if not completely specious, as we saw in Chapter 5. Unless people are prepared to give up literacy books, modern music, physical comfort, and the great wealth of philosophical, scientific, and cultural ideas associated with civilization, the basic decision they face is how to use their vast fund of technological knowledge and devices, not whether to use them. This decision is of momentous social proportions, and must not be based strictly on a subjective love or distaste for technological innovation. In a better world, humanity might choose to discard many components of its current technological equipment, possibly sophisticate others, and innovate ecologically more desirable ways of producing things. But without a techniques that will free humanity from onerous toil, and without values that stress democratic forms of social organization in which everyone can participate, all hopes for a free society in the future are chimeras. Technological innovation, in itself, will not increase the free time that is needed for a democratic political culture. Indeed, in class societies the use of technologies to displace labor by machines, to deforest vast areas of the planet, to exploit low-wage populations in the third world, all raise precisely the social issue of the ways in which technology is used. Nor are all technologies neutral in their impact on social and ecological well-being or even necessarily desirable. Clearly some technologies, such as nuclear weapons and power plants, should be banned completely. The same can be said for agricultural and industrial biocides, surveillance devices, high-tech weaponry, and a host of other socially and ecologically harmful techniques. But to glibly abstract technology from its social context, to let destructive current uses of technologies outweigh their potentially more rational application in a better society would deny us the opportunity to choose what technologies should be used and the forms they will take. Various societies use a given technology in radically different ways, some for personally profitable and exploitative ends, others use it restrictively, owing to traditions of parsimony or fears of social instability, and still others might well use it rationally to advance human freedom, self-development, and an ecological sensibility. Modern technophobes, especially of the mystical persuasion, tend to confuse social with technological factors. Langdon Winner, one of the more informed critics of technology indiscriminately intermingles social with technological factors, an approach that often makes the most specious defenses of technophobia seem almost plausible. Winner observes, quote, 
if the experience of modern society shows us anything it is that technologies are not merely aids to human activity but also powerful forces acting to reshape that activity and its meaning. The introduction of a robot to an industrial workplace not only increases productivity, but often radically changes the process of production, redefining what work means in that setting. When a sophisticated new technique or instrument is adopted in medical practice, it transforms not only what doctors do, but also the ways people think about health, sickness, and medical care. Widespread alterations of this kind in techniques of communication, transportation, manufacturing, agriculture, and the like are largely what distinguishes our times from early periods of human history. The kinds of things we are apt to see as mere technological entities become much more interesting and problematic if we begin to observe how broadly they are involved in conditions of social and moral life. End quote. Note. Langdon Winner, The Whale, and The Reactor, A Search for Limits in an Age of High Technology, Chicago and London, University of Chicago Press, 1986, p6. End note. But how a technology affects social context depends entirely on which new technologies are introduced and the reasons for introducing them. In a cooperative society, unlike the one in which we live today, a robot introduced into a factory environment might remove people from onerous toil and assembly line drudgery, leaving them free to engage in pleasurable and creative activity. On the other hand, in a market, profit-oriented society like the one in which we live today a robot would probably intensify the exploitation of workers whose tasks are orchestrated by the presence of a robot and increase the economic problems of those who are displaced by it. Winner's unitary statement about the impact of a robot on work, in effect, lacks sufficient social contextuality and tends to be more obfuscatory than illuminating. Implicit in Winner's notion of technological somnambulism, in which we so willingly sleepwalk through the process of reconstituting the conditions of human existence, is his own social somnambulism. Note. Ebedem, P10. End note. For Winner, the existing society is a given, seemingly unalterable phenomenon, the background for existing and future technological innovation. That technology autonomously orchestrates rather than is orchestrated by the social context in which tools and machines exist is essentially assumed. That the reduction of work by a robot may, in fact, make life easier, indeed richer, that its effects could be minimal or even desirable is not spelled out in his book, which is tilted toward theorists who see technology as shaping society. Like many technophobes who are preoccupied with unexplained technological imperatives and the psychic effects of technological change, Winner marginalizes the centrality of social issues. Thus, he calls upon his readers to be aware of the ramifications of technological change upon society and its values, a rather foggy request, since the nature of the present society its conflicting interests, and rational alternatives to the present human condition remain unexplored and are as problematically intermeshed as ever with each other. So are questions about who controls the development of technology. In the harsh, real world, those who decide which new technologies are or are not to be introduced into workplaces, hospitals, offices, and factories are the proprietors of those operations. Not even managers, engineers, and scientists, or what has been loosely called the new class, make long-range decisions about the use of technologies in the modern economy. Ultimately it is the owners and directors of a particular concern, least of all ordinary citizens, who decide what kind of technology will be used in a given enterprise as the formulation of recent downsizing policies by large corporations throughout the world so clearly reveal. These owners and directors are concerned less with the social, psychological, and ideological impacts of a new technology than with the profit and competitive advantages it may yield. Less socially visible than the corporate bosses of an earlier era, like the old John D. Rockefeller, contemporary bosses are often highly professional and well-trained in the more complex aspects of business management and engineering and their authority stems ultimately from their power as owners and directors at the apex of the economic pyramid, not merely as knowledgeable technical personnel. Winner's outlook tends to conceal the real issues of social power. 
Much as technology may enhance the operations of a given society it is a distinct means deployed by self-serving owners and directors to exercise their power and increase their gains. By emphasizing the effects that new technologies have upon people and their values, Winner's book keeps us from clearly understanding that these effects are the results of manipulations by definable social elites whose behavior, in real life, is guided overwhelmingly by economic facts, not by the extent to which ordinary people suffer from technological somnambulism. Doubtless, as Winner argues, technological changes affect the texture of modern life, but social changes affect modern life far more drastically. Thus, a Renaissance banker of some 400 years ago, say a member of the Fugger banking family, held a view of the world, possessed an individualized sense of self, and had political values that were much more akin to those of a modern businessman than, say of an Athenian citizen in peri-clean times. Yet Greek and Renaissance technologies were remarkably similar by comparison with Renaissance and modern ones. Both the Fugger banker and the modern banker lived in a calculating, money-oriented, egoistic, and commercial world that for many Greeks would have seemed debasing and asocial. Athenians of the 5th century BC were expected to place the interests of the polis or so-called city-state before personal considerations and generally viewed commerce as a degrading activity unfit for an authentic citizen, an attitude that stood in marked contrast to Fugger and modern bankers. Although the technological distance between commercially oriented Renaissance bankers and Athenians was relatively small, the psychological distance between the two was immense. Winner's assertion of technological autonomy ultimately becomes technological determinism. If our instruments are institutions in the making, as he fatalistically declares and techni has at last become politeia, then our behavior is determined by technological factors. Nor is there any real hope that the political wisdom of a democracy can discipline technological innovation, since it would require qualities of judiciousness in the populace that have rarely been applied to the judgment of instrumental-slash-functional affairs. Note. Ebedim, pages 54, 55. End note. His book, The Whale and the Reactor, ends with a question, at present our society seems to prefer monuments to gigantism, war, and the overstepping of natural and cultural boundaries. Such are the accomplishments we support with our dollars and our votes. How long will it be until we are ready to do anything better? Note. Ebedim, pages 177 to 8. End note. Which question sidesteps the issue of how effective voting can be in a political system that is an oligarchy of the powerful and wealthy, a fact that leaves the preferences of our society very much in doubt and its exposure to radically fresh alternatives very limited, so say the least. Among the less sophisticated technophobes, like Jerry Mander, the ambiguities that mark Winner's treatment of technology become wild sloganeering, laced with appeals to the sacred and genuflections before primitives, whom Mander ecumenically calls Indians whether they are native to the Americas or not. Intellectually, Manders in the absence of the sacred is a cacophony of wildly discordant arguments that intermingles the social and the technological with a degree of abandon that verges on the embarrassing. Note. Mander, absence of the sacred. End note. Technology we are told, is all pervasive. It invades our consciousness and, with each generation of technical development, separates us from the natural world by enfolding us in a purely technological environment. Again, the mega-machine image rears its terrifying head, the web of interactions among machines becomes more complex and more invisible while the total effect is more powerful and pervasive. We become ever more enclosed and ever less aware of that fact. Our environment is so much a product of our invention that it becomes a single worldwide machine. We live inside it, and are a piece of it. Note. Ebedim, P32. End note. In Mander's view, this web of interactions is almost entirely a product of technology as such and the mentality it breeds. A director of the Berkeley based Elmwood Institute Mander delivers what Kirkpatrick Sale enthusiastically lauds as a skewering critique of modern technology in which cars, telephones, computers, banks, 
biogenetics and television all are shown to be part of a mad megatechnology that is destroying the world's resources and robotizing its peoples. Note. Ebedum, back cover. And note. The reader cannot help but wonder which of these terrifying technological artifacts are actually used by the Elmwood Institute's members and associates. Indeed, Mander, who robustly celebrates the fact that he merely uses an old IBM Selectric, may well be an exception among his associates. Note. Ebedum, pages 33. And note. In any case like personal computers, not even old, indeed ancient IBM select ricks grow on trees. In a heady passage, Mander celebrates his technologically simple childhood world in the Bronx of the 1930s and 1940s, during which time his mother's favorite activity was shopping and a physician, whose principal pharmaceutical seems to have been aspirin, attended to his family's health needs. The Mander family of this blissful era had a television in the living room that featured Milton Burley, at a time when broadcasting was happily restricted to seven hours each day. Mander Sr.'s prize possession was a Buick sedan that he rotated only every three years and the Manders were satisfied with annual family trips to Florida, plus a stay at summer camp for Mander Jr. Note. He beat him, P11-24. And note. Yet how free of consumerism and technology was this halcyon era, 40 or 50 years ago? Did Mrs. Mander beat the dirt out of her family's clothing with a scrub board and squeeze out the water with rollers, while Mr. Mander indulged his passion for new Buicks? Did she clean the floors on her knees? Did she carry heavy shopping bags, filled with food staples, or was she driven to and from market by Mander Sr. in a new Buick? Mander Jr. does not enter into these trivial details. But having grown up in the same Bronx milieu a generation or so earlier, I feel obliged to protest that the Manders enjoyed eminently privileged middle-class comforts and technological goodies that were entirely unknown to me, my family and my friends. From the very beginning of the 1920s to well into the 1930s, my own family did not even own even a radio still less a car, television set, or telephone. Nor were they so privileged as to make trips to Florida or send me to summer camp. At the onset of the Depression, my mother and I did not even have a family physician. Instead, when we were sick, we sat for hours in the clinics of New York City's public hospitals, hoping to receive any kind of medical attention. I am not trying to guilt Mander or trade experiences with him. His technophobia is premised on a fairly well-to-do way of life, as is the technophobia of so many baby boomers of late. His deprecation of antibiotics rings hollow at a time when children underwent dangerous mastoid bone surgery for deadly ear infections and elderly people became seriously ill from even minor wounds. Without antibiotics, I would probably have died of a streptococcus infection in the early 1940s. There is a sickening arrogance in technophobes who, having enjoyed the fruits of middle class, even wealthy lifestyles, condemn appliances that freed women from considerable domestic drudgery, machines that freed workers from mentally debilitating tasks on assembly lines, and opened alternatives to starvation in lands that were once completely at the mercy of Mother Nature and her many climatic vagaries. In extolling the relative technological simplicity of his Bronx childhood, Mander, in fact, is extolling a culture, the Jewish immigrant middle-class way of life, that was pre-industrial in many respects, that had not yet been completely penetrated by the marketplace. Its language, values, family structure and ideals were ultimately eroded not by technology, which, in fact, its members generally prized as much as Mr. Mander did his Buick, but by the socially invasive power of capitalism and its commodity orientation. My own mother, an Eastern European immigrant, welcomed with almost sublime ecstasy her first Frigidaire and her access to washing and drying machines. To own a motorized vehicle in my childhood and youth would have been regarded as an unimaginable luxury, indeed a mark of new social status. Summer vacations were hardly common among poor people who had to haggle for lower food prices. As an adult, I worked as a foundry man and auto worker, 
to be finally free from that toil was an occupational epiphany of a kind at least as intense as the one Mander himself seems to have experienced after he left his work with advertising agencies and drifted into the Elmwood Institute. Mander's careless confusion of the pre-industrial cultural roots of his family with the social uses of technology lead to the same ideological disarray that marks Winner's more sophisticated book. Despite their different levels of discussion, both writers repeatedly confuse the promise of technological innovation in a rational society with its abuses in the present irrational one. With considerable aplomb, we are shown that technology does not, after all, produce more leisure today, as though today were somehow forever, or that radicals of past generations did not know that technology can be used for exploitative ends under capitalism, as it can be for liberating ends in a cooperative society. Worse still, technology creates more work, we are told with minimal references to society because people must now hold two jobs instead of one, as a result of the way an innovation currently yields partial employment and lowered income. That an avaricious class of proprietors and administrators must, and want to, gain a competitive edge in the market with unseemly profits and that money leads to exploitation all but eludes Mander, who develops a serious case of social somnambulism. The vested economic interests that use technological innovations to exploit rather than diminish labor are not only freed of their odium, but scented by flamboyant denunciations of techniques as such. Thus, after conceding that medical technology on the whole aids longer life and that is good, Mander, as a contrast, then mingles apples with oranges by reminding us that the murder rate in the United States has skyrocketed, that the prison population is bursting, that suicide and drug use have reached epidemic proportions, that 32 million Americans live in poverty that 13% of the population has no health insurance, that 3 million people are homeless, that 27% are functionally illiterate, and that 28 million American adults suffer from one or another kind of mental disorder. Note. Ebedem, pages 28-9. to End note. One is obliged to ask is all this really because of technology? Finally having recited more statistics on the extent of environmental degradation, Mander might be expected to deliver a powerful rebuke against a society that permits, indeed fosters, these terrible patently social, abuses. Instead, we are told, given that technology was supposed to make life better, and given its apparent failure in both the social and the environmental spheres shouldn't reason dictate that we sharply question the wild claims we have accepted about technology. Note. Ebedem, P29, emphasis added. End note. Permeated as his book is by social amnesia, the reader often has the feeling that if only people could all get together in a huge encounter group, possibly at the Elmwood Institute all our problems could be happily resolved. We are, it appears, entranced by a pro-technology paradigm that has dazzled us into a belief in the promise of technotopia. If only we could remove its inherent appeal to our psyches, we might, guided by the sacred, as defined by California's version of Native American sensibilities, find our way to self and possibly social redemption. Note. Ebedem, P381. End note. As to society Mander's insights are sparse. The most seminal thought in in the absence of the sacred is that corporations are machines, by which he means that corporations constitute a business technology and are the product of a technological mentality. Note. Ebedem, P121. In fact, Chapter 7 of the book is entitled Corporations as Machines. End note. That corporations are impersonal and amoral, hence, machine-like, might make this formulation a reasonably good metaphor, provided that Mander explored their function as sources of profit and capital accumulation. But these basic attributes of any capitalistic enterprise are given minimal attention. The profit imperative, one of his subheadings, receives four scant lines, and no analysis is given to back up his conclusion that profit is the ultimate measure of all corporate decisions. Note. Ebedem, P129. End note. The growth imperative, which immediately follows Mander's impressively abbreviated discussion of profit, 
occupies less than half a page, and it too is notable for its lack of serious analysis of the impelling factors in capital expansion. Last, Mander sees competition and aggression primarily as an internal problem within individual corporations, a form of personal agonistic activity comparable to the behavior of competing professional football players. Note. Ebedem, pages 129-30. End note. Mander's interpretation of technology is basically obscurantist, conceived as a quasi-mystical web of interactions, technology not only takes on an almost psychic and self-generative life of its own, but it is given an overpowering presence in every dimension of human affairs. In Marx's concept of the fetishism of commodities, people who make the things they consume seem under capitalism to be mysteriously ruled by them, so for Mander, technology which results from interactions between human beings and the natural world, becomes a mysterious autonomous force that plays a formative and overriding role in the human condition. To understand the authentic reality of the human condition today we are thus obliged to strip away not only the fetishism of commodities but also the fetishism of technology. Not only do we live far more within a very real web of commodity relationships than technological ones, but we are justifiably far more afflicted by a market-oriented mentality than by a technological one. We are far more concerned with securing a living than with assessing the extent to which technology affects our psyches. Our thinking is fashioned along quantified lines more because of our attempts to balance a dwindling domestic budget than because of the influence of Cartesian mechanism. The social amnesia that afflicts technophobes and anti-humanists generates an arrogance toward the seemingly mundane problems that people ordinarily face, a new age arrogance much greater than the arrogance of so-called technotopians, a category that seems to include almost everyone who is seriously concerned with human welfare and the achievement of a materially abundant society. Indeed, left to its own devices, the present society might well produce environmental dislocations so profound that humanity will be obliged to live in a technotopia and artificially created environment, with no appeals whatever for a return to the sacred, least of all to a contrived paleolithic spirituality, will be able to bring back the ozone layer, restore a breathable atmosphere, undo the damage to basic biogeochemical cycles, and cleanse a hopelessly poisoned water. Supply if such a sweeping ecological regression were ever to occur, future generations might well have to build domes over their cities, create oxygen-making machines, and produce synthetic food. Such a nightmarish future, with its despotic political consequences, would not be the product of technological innovation or thinking. It would be the product of a social system that, by its competitive nature, with or without technological innovations, is incapable of placing any limits on growth and limits on the acquisition of profit with which to grow. If the competitive market society continues to expand unopposed, it will be because the serious radical movements for social change of former decades have been supplanted in recent years by anti-humanist, mystical, and technophobic cults for self-redemption and narcissistic epiphanies. As to Mander's knowledge of the sacred, much of the anthropology in In the Absence of the Sacred is questionable drawn largely from the native man the hunter school of the 1960s and 1970s. Mander is characteristic of the more widely read anti-technological writers around these days, and like many of his pop confreres has nourished a great deal of today's rising technophobia. But other theorists deal philosophically with technology in writings that have broad implications for the conflict between enlightened humanism and anti-humanism, Jacques Ellul's Technological Society one of the ancestral literary sources of present-day technophobia, criticizes not only technology as such but technique, indeed, he gives the term such a broad scope that it can essentially be defined as nearly any means for effectuating a goal today, the term technique, as I use it, he writes, does not mean machines, technology, or this or that procedure for attaining an end. In our technological society technique is the totality of methods rationally arrived at and having absolute efficiency, for a given stage of development, in every field of human activity. It might well be supposed that Eliel is talking as much about human-generated causality in the modern world as he is about tools and machines. Note. Jacques Eliel, The Technological Society, New York, 
Vintage Books, 1964, p. XXV and Note. Although Eliel gives us no specific reason to believe that technique as such is good or bad, it clearly becomes degraded when reason and consciousness enter into technical operations. Inasmuch as every technical operation unavoidably involves reason and consciousness, it is hard to believe that technique can ever exclude thought. Thus the two words are functionally interchangeable. Indeed, if Eliel is to be taken seriously humanity has always been living in a technological age insofar as thought and tools have been operationally interactive with each other. Claiming that he does not deny the existence of individual action or of some inner sphere of freedom, Eliel notes that these are not discernible at the most general level of analysis. Note. Ebedum, emphases added, PXXVIII. End note. This entrance into the inner sphere of freedom necessarily renders his book into an interpretive, not merely a factual, work, which means that we can only ask whether his interpretations are true and his facts accurate. On both accounts, Eliel significantly fails us. In a work that grandly marches from the primitive to the industrial revolution and reports on the characterology of technique in general, its modern characteristics, its influence on the economy its interaction with the state, and so on through a host of highly nuanced issues and topics, interpretation, of course is utterly unavoidable. Indeed, from the moment he enters into a discussion of primitive technique, he presses views on magic that rest on uncertain and speculative grounds. So too in his discussion of the ancient Mediterranean, Asian, and Christian worlds, during which, apart from a tangential reference to Archimedes, he completely omits the extraordinary technological achievements of the Hellenistic age. But what is at issue, here, is not that Eliel is to be faulted for loading his book with interpretations. Quite to the contrary the fault lies with his utterly bizarre insistence that he doesn't do so. Although Eliel asserts that in his book he has deliberately not gone beyond description and denies that he is a pessimist, the conclusions of his considerable tome flagrantly belie these disavowals. Note. Ebedum, PXXVII. End note. In fact, he is a clumsy technological determinist, perhaps not a rigorous one, as he puts it, but significantly so. And he is immensely pessimistic. What Eliel does is to formulate a ubiquitous dialectic of technique that inexorably ends in a dictatorial megamachine. His closing chapter, A Look at the Future, which ends with A Look at the Year 2000, describes, quote, The monolithic technical world that is coming to be. It is vanity to pretend it can be checked or guided. Indeed, the human race is beginning confusedly to understand at last that it is living in a new and unfamiliar universe. The new technological order was meant to be a buffer between man and nature. Unfortunately it has evolved autonomously in such a way that man has lost all contact with his natural framework and has to do only with the organized technical intermediary which sustains relations both with the world of life and the world of brute matter. Note. Ebedum, P428. End note. Anticipating Mander and others like him, Eliel declares, enclosed within his artificial creation, man finds that there is no exit, that he cannot pierce the shell of technology to find again the ancient milieu to which he was adapted for hundreds of thousands of years. Note. Ebedum, P428. End note. This prelapsarian vision of an ancient milieu to which man was adapted for hundreds of thousands of years, the most ragged myth advanced by primitivists, ecomistics, and technophobes, collapses under critical scrutiny. Although the different hominid species were variously vegetarian food gatherers, scavengers, and perhaps only within the past 60,000 years, fairly sophisticated hunters, there is even evidence that they began to systematically cultivate food during certain seasons in the Nile Valley some 30,000 years ago, when much of Europe was still glaciated and the famous Magdalenian culture was flourishing in southern France and the Pyrenees. It is important to stress these variations not only because they controvert the fiction of a single Paleolithic sensibility but because Eliel, like so many other technophobes, 
bases his account of why the first steps were taken toward a technological society exclusively on ideological and subjective factors. After rejecting the common notion that these steps were the result of scientific progress, which prepared the way for technical progress, but it cannot explain it, and noting that it would exaggerate the force of Enlightenment philosophic ideas and systems to give them the highest place in the history of techniques, Eliel settles upon the optimistic atmosphere of the 18th century more than Enlightenment philosophy. Note. Ibedem, pages 46, 47. End note. This explanation is extraordinary. Relying on Lewis Mumford's very uneven account of the development of techniques, the descriptive vividness of Mumford's narrations and style can easily be mistaken for a causal account, Eliel concedes that the accretions of small technical advances finally laid the basis for a qualitative leap, together with population increases, a flexible economic life, and, most decisively, the plasticity of the social milieu. Note. Ibedem, p. 48-9. End note. But as to what made for this plasticity and, presumably the receptivity of people to sweeping technological innovations, Eliel gives us a jumble of ideological reasons ranging from the impact of Christianity to the breakup of traditional social groups. To be sure, the bourgeoisie, Eliel concedes, did play a role in catapulting the pre-industrial 18th century into the highly industrial 19th century but it was not enough to carry the whole of society along with it. Note. Ibedem, p. 54. And note. That the bourgeoisie did not need the whole of society to go along with it owing to its economic power seems to elude Eliel. In fact, Rather absurdly Eliel tells us that Karl Marx rehabilitated technique in the eyes of the workers by preaching that it can be liberating, as though Marx were that influential in the middle of the 19th century, which Eliel regards as his golden moment, and the industrial proletariat sprang up like mushrooms after a vigorous rain following the publication, barely noticed, of the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Note. Ibedem, P54. The clumsiness of Eliel's argument has to be read to be fully appreciated. End note. Philosophically sophisticated technophobes who find the likes of Mander particularly crude can always come to the works of Martin Heidegger, who essentially elevates techni, and presumably technology, to a largely metaphysical category. The tortured complexities of Heidegger's ontology of being are beyond the scope of this chapter, nor is it possible here, to cope in any detail with a philosophy that notoriously followed so many different woodpaths and engaged in so many turns, to use Heidegger's own jargon. My account of Heidegger's ontology is admittedly selective and focused on its unadorned essentials. I may add that Heidegger, not to speak of his many disciples, was very much at odds with himself from the 1920s to the last years of his life in the 1970s. Insofar as Heidegger can be said to have had a project to shape human life ways, it was as an endeavor to resist, or should I say to mer from, what he conceived to be an all-encroaching technocratic mentality and civilization that rendered human beings inauthentic in their relationship to a presumably self-generative reality isness, or more esoterically, being, sen. Not unlike many German reactionaries, Heidegger viewed modernity with its democratic spirit, rationalism, respect for the individual, and technological advances as a falling, gefallen, from a primal and naive innocence in which humanity once dwelled, remnants of which he believed existed in the rustic world into which he was born a century ago. Authenticity, it can be said without any philosophical frills, lay in the pristine Teutonic world of the tribal Germans who retained their ties with the gods, and with later peoples who still tried to nourish their past amidst the blighted traits of the modern world. Since some authors try to muddy Heidegger's prelapsarian message by focusing on his assumed belief in individual freedom and ignoring his hatred of the French Revolution and its egalitarian, herd-like democracy of the they, it is worth emphasizing that such a view withers in the light of his denial of individuality. The individual by himself counts for nothing, he declared after becoming a member of the National Socialist Party in 1933. The fate of our vogue in its state counts for everything. Note. Quoted in Richard Vallin, The Politics of Being, 
The Political Thought of Martin Heidegger, New York and Oxford, Columbia University Press, 1990, p. 4. End note. As a member of the Nazi Party which he remained up to the defeat of Germany 12 years later, his anti-humanism reached strident, often blatantly reactionary proportions. Newly appointed as the rector of the University of Freiburg upon Hitler's ascent to power, he readily adopted the Führer principle of German fascism and preferred the title Rector Führer, hailing the spirit of National Socialism as an antidote to the darkening of the world, the flight of the gods, the destruction of the earth by technology, the transformation of men into a mass, the hatred and suspicion of everything free and creative. Note. Martin Heidegger, An Introduction to Metaphysics, New Haven, Yale University Press, 1959, p. 38. End note. His most unsavory remarks were directed in the lectures from which these lines are taken, from a metaphysical point of view, against the pincers created by America and Russia that threatened to squeeze the farthermost corner of the globe by technology and economic exploitation. Note. Ebedem, p. 39. End note. Technology as Heidegger construes it, is no mere means. Technology is a way of revealing. If we give heed to this, then another whole realm for the essence of technology will open itself up to us. It is the realm of revealing, i.e., of truth. Note. Martin Heidegger, The Question Concerning Technology, in David Farrell Krell, ed. Basic Writings, New York, Harper and Row, 1977, p. 294. End note. After which Heidegger rolls out technology's transformations, indeed mutations, which give rise to a mood of anxiety and finally hubris, anthropocentricity and the mechanical coercion of things into mere objects for human use and exploitation. Heidegger's views on technology are part of a larger Weltanschung which is too multicolored to discuss here, and demands a degree of interpretive effort we must forego for the present in the context of a criticism of technophobia. Suffice it to say that there is a good deal of primitivistic animaism in Heidegger's treatment of the revealing that occurs when techni is a clearing for the expression of a crafted material not unlike the Eskimo sculptor who believes, quite wrongly, I may add, that he is bringing out a hidden form that lies in the walrus ivory he is carving. But this issue must be seen more as a matter of metaphysics than of a spiritually charged technique. Thus, when Heidegger praises a windmill, in contrast to the challenge to a tract of land from which the hauling out of coal and ore is subjected, he is not being ecological. Heidegger is concerned with a windmill, not as an ecological technology but more metaphysically with the notion that its sails do indeed turn in the wind, they are left entirely to the wind's blowing. The windmill does not unlock energy from the air currents in order to store it. Note. Heidegger, Question Concerning Technology p. 296. End note. Like man in relation to being, it is a medium for the realization of wind, not an artifact for acquiring power. Basically this interpretation of a technological interrelationship reflects a regression, socially and psychologically as well as metaphysically, into quietism. Heidegger advances a message of passivity or passivity conceived as a human activity and endeavor to let things be and disclose themselves. Letting things be would be little more than a trite Taoist and Buddhist precept were it not that Heidegger as a national socialist became all too ideologically engaged, rather than letting things be, when he was busily undoing intellectualism, democracy and technological intervention into the world. Considering the time, the place, and the abstract way in which Heidegger treated humanity's fall into technological inauthenticity, a fall that he, like Eliel, regarded as inevitable albeit a metaphysical, nightmare, it is not hard to see why he could trivialize the Holocaust, when he deigned to notice it at all, as part of a techno-industrial condition. Agriculture is now a motorized, motor regard food industry in essence the same as the manufacturing of corpses in the gas chambers and extermination camps, he coldly observed, the same as the blockade and starvation of the countryside, the same as the production of the hydrogen bombs. Note. Cited in Wolfgang Skernacker, Technik und die Glasenheit, 
Zeitkritik nach Heidegger, Freiburg and Munich, Verlag Karl Alber, 1983, p. 25. This mean-spirited and unrepentant passage appears in English translation in Victor Ferius's Heidegger and Nazism, Philadelphia, Temple University Press, 1989, p. 287. Perius's extraordinary brilliantly researched study of Heidegger covers his repellent ideas, career, and attempts at subterfuge after Hitler's collapse and the academic enterprise of his acolytes to see the self-anointed Führer of National Socialist philosophy as more than an ideological miscreant. No less is Perius's book an indictment of Heideggerian mandarins, big and small, in the academy today. End note. In placing the industrial means by which many Jews were killed before the ideological ends that guided their Nazi exterminators, Heidegger essentially displaces the barbarism of a specific state apparatus, of which he was a part, by the technical proficiency he can attribute to the world at large. These immensely revealing offhand remarks, drawn from a speech he gave in Bremen in 1949, are beneath contempt but they point to a way of thinking that gave an autonomy to technique that has fearful moral consequences which we are living with these days in the name of the sacred, a phraseology that Heidegger would find very congenial were he alive today. Indeed, technophobia, followed to its logical and crudely primitivistic conclusions, finally devolves into a dark reactionism. And a paralyzing quietism. For if our confrontation with civilization turns on passivity before a disclosing of being, a mere dwelling on the earth, and a letting things be, to use Heidegger's verbiage, much of which has slipped into deep ecology's vocabulary as well, the choice between supporting barbarism and enlightened humanism has no ethical foundations to sustain it. Freed of values grounded in objectivity we are lost in a quasi-religious anti-humanism, a spirituality that can with the same equanimity hear the cry of a bird and ignore the anguish of six million once living people who were put to death by the National Socialist State.